Hello, and welcome to Cha'a with Roma. I am joined today by multi-award winning poet who is currently based in the United States of America, Patrick Rosal. He has a new book, The New and Selected Poems from Persia Books. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Roma, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm I'm good. It's starting to get starting to get cold here in New Jersey. Oh, is it autumn? Yeah, and we're, we're it's autumn, and we're about to head into winter. I think that the forecast says that we're, we're probably going to get some snow next week. So it'll be the first snow of the. Oh wow! Of the it's autumn here, but it's always cloudy. I can see some sunshine sunshine on your walls, <laughs> so that's nice. It, it is. It's. It's sunny out. <laughs> so nice to have you here on Cha with Roma, and thank you for for your time, Patrick. Oh, you're so welcome. It's really nice to it's nice to talk to you live. I know. I hope we can see each other um, sometime in person. I love it. Is it okay if you could um, treat us to a poem to begin with? Of course, of course. I'm going to read um, a poem called "Delenda Undone." Uh, which is from my third book, um, Bone Shepherds. Oh, yes. Delenda Undone, after Cornelius Eady. And so, we've all been told to shut up. Don't talk, they say, too fast, too loud, or for too long. Don't take too much time trying to tell the truth, but this is my work, to break out among strangers into laughter. How I've watched small children, for example, fill with the lucky gust a poem can ride into the near stillness of a room and dance. For that, I am always, as now, grateful. My father tells me in his seminary days during the Japanese occupation, most of the priests who ran that school were German. The boys then were to speak only in Latin and would surely be slapped three Sundays back if heard speaking the language of my father's country, which is a beautiful country and a beautiful language and which has a curious word for being so suddenly seized by affection. You clench every muscle from your eyelids to your toes for wanting to hold a loved one tight, to squeeze one and kiss one so deep Deep, you place yourself and your beloved on the brink of physical harm. There's no word for this in English. No word for those small provinces of silence or for the kind of love that will trouble that silence into music. My work is trying to find the very word rippling in my body, which is a woman's body, my mother's and a man's body, my father's, and nowhere to be found in the languages that have conquered the lands of my ancestors. On the outskirts of every empire, there are man-made lakes large enough to receive with ease 100 villages worth of bones tossed into them. This is a fact. There are more than 7 million Ilocanos in the Philippines, maybe a million in diaspora. All of us at one time or another have been told to shut up, don't talk too loud, too slow, or for too long. In Saudi Arabia, in Madrid, in Tokyo, in Milan, on Bowery near the foot of First Street, we've been told this. Some of us have been famous liars. Ferdinand, for example, who married another liar, Imelda and my grandfather. Capitana de Barrio, who claimed to kick the shit barefisted and single-handedly out of 14 ruffians in the small barangay of Santo Tomas. Actually, he kicked the shit out of five. Nine ran away. 
These are not lies. This is the truth. I'm not wealthy. I can't buy space or time on billboards or websites. The name I inherit doesn't part columns in the city's daily journal. My family comes from a long line of farmers. My cousins scrub their chopping blocks with salt. They shush the goats before they kill them. Hmm. Beautiful, Patrick. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Roma. I mean, there's sort of a lot of like different streams that 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 went into it, but I was, it was, you know, I wrote this in sort of like, oh gosh, this must have been around 2009 or 2010 or so, and um, I was just, I was, you know, I was just sort of observing, and I had been aware of the poetry world, both the kind of spoken word and slam scene and the more print and academic world and how in across the board, there are people who are more interested in rules and time limits and, you know, all these sort of pedantic concerns around poetry and, and really at sacrificing what I thought was the soul of, uh, of the poem. And, mm. There's a really beautiful poem by um, by um, Cornelius Eady called Gratitude. And um, it's a poem about him being a black poet and the expectations or the lack of expectation of what he might or might not be as a black poet in America. And he talks about, this is my work. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking in, the, in this whole context, my work is not just to fo follow page lengths and 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 time limits, it's it's trying to it's trying sometimes impossibly to get closer to the truth, mm -hmm. and so um, you know the poem I think is a is a is a uh, it's a meditation on on the erasure of, of truth and 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 poets who are trying to retrieve something that is like the truth and really trying even though this is a very very difficult thing to do the title itself delenda and dunn comes from um oh my god was it was it was it pliny who 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 was it i'm gonna get the i'm gonna get the roman senator wrong but there was a roman senator who who would say um uh cartago delenda s like carthage carthage must be must be burned, must be must must be ruined, and mm -hmm. and um, the word delenda actually come it um, in Latin um, comes into English um, through the word deleted, and so it's like it's like mm -hmm. the poem is about sort of like trying to imagine undoing the deletion of history. Um, so that's I mean there's a lot sort of going on in in the poem, but I mean I think the last thing that I want to say about that is that it's it arrives at this thing at the uh, at the last line, which is that or that those last few lines and um it it's also it's also inward looking and it thinks about how um while we can think about colonialism and racism as sort of like these 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 historical structures that have deleted and, and erased things that it it starts to look inward and and ask in what ways am i and my own history familial history how am i and how are we complicit in the deletions and the erasures of history too, and I, 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 you know, that's a that's a that's something that I feel that duality of, of like how do we, how do we account for the various sort of erasures in history? It's not just out there mm. in the world, but it's it's in it's in here too. Mm. And I could really relate to what you're saying about looking at how erasure has been done. Thank There's you. so many things that's going on there. Family, history, mm. culture. So that's our outside view, but also looking into ourselves. To acknowledge, to acknowledge that we are we're agents of it all the time. Like, mm. like I think that it's I think sort of one of the dangers, and it seems to be more prevalent now, is to sort of separate, oh, here are the good guys and here are the bad guys. Mm. And there's plenty of injustice in the world. And and there's there, I think that the, it, one of the jobs of the poet is to bear witness and say, that's wrong. But it's not just out there that we point at what's wrong. We have to sort of look in here and the, see, how am I? How am I replicating the thing that I'm pointing to out there? Does it exist in here too? Mm -hmm. That feels like a really important dimension of, of my own work for sure. Um, and a lot of the poems that I, that I care about. 
And when you're reflecting on that a specific aspect of your craft, Patrick, how are you as a poet um, or what happens within you when you start to think, how am I replicating this? Do you also think, how am I going to stop replicating it? Um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully that's, hopefully, hopefully that's, that's, what, the... <laughs> that, that's what's going to happen. I mean, but in order, in, in order to sort of, in order to take a course of action, I think that it takes, um, it takes, you know, some scrutiny, some self scrutiny in order to do that. And so to me, that's, that's what the poem is about. It's like, how, mm. how does this sort of simultaneous scrutiny of the world and the world inside the self mm. um, happen inside poems and inside language? How does it happen inside poems and inside language? When you're trying to craft a poem, what can you tell us more about what are you trying to consider? I'm trying to I'm trying to say something that I haven't said before. Trying to put words together in a way that I haven't put them together before. And probably the principal craft tool that I use to try to get at that is is sound and is mm. and, and is music. So I'm constantly listening to the sonic quality of the language that is on the page. People always ask me, do you do you read your poems aloud when you're when you're writing and revising? Mm. And I'm like, I don't I don't really know how to write or revise without reading the poem aloud because the the words on the page are just kind of an artifact of mm. of what the poem is the poem is a is a it, it's made of sound to me it's not made of just like ink on a page it's made of it's made of these these reverberations in the air and these reverberations um they have they have patterns and surprises and 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 in my process, what I'm doing is I'm paying attention to the pleasure of those patterns and those mm. and those surprises. I was just going to say there is such a strong musicality in your poems. Um, you mentioned a while ago that you came into my understanding is you came into poetry knowing that there is um, performative aspect of it and page aspect of it, and I know that you also play the guitar. Um, as a hobby, mm -hmm. or I'm not sure if you play it professionally, but I see it on your Facebook page, uh, and you're very good at it. You mentioned <laughs> in one of your interviews that your father is a self-taught musician, and I think all Filipino men are self-taught musicians in a way, you know, when, yeah. uh, when we all gather together, have our karaoke on or our guitar. You mentioned a phrase in one of your interviews that I watch on YouTube where you said the land is carried through sounds mm. and i thought wow that's very true but i wonder if you could tell us more about this oh this is uh let me see there's a lot there i do play guitar i also play keyboards piano and i've been studying um oh wow Afro you play the piano as well yeah um afro-cuban percussion as well and a little bit of flute and bass so i've I've been I, I was I was a musician before I was a writer actually and so coming I, I and a and a dancer I was a b-boy when I was when I was growing up in the 1980s and so all those practices I was a mm -hmm. DJ too so all those practices of dance and music and gathering um they were already the foundation before I started started writing poems and so um I, I think that naturally sort of moved me towards paying attention to the music yeah. in the language. Um, that assertion about about music in the land is sort of a is a complicated one. And I want to preface it with something that you just sort of said um, about Filipino men in particular yeah. being being musicians. And particularly here in the United States, um, you know, Filipino men the 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 sort of largest wave in the early part of the 20th century they were laborers including my my grandfather who um who was a sakata in hawaii and cut mm -hmm. cut sugarcane <clears throat> and you have to understand that these men um were not um they weren't they were largely not married because they didn't the americans didn't want Filipino men coming here and starting families. Um, at the same time, they also prevented 
Filipino men from mixing with American women, white women. And so you have to have a social life. And I, and I, I believe that a lot of that social life was built around music and these men learning, you know, to, to, to entertain one another and dance with one another for that matter, right? Um, and eventually dance in these taxi dance halls. They would dance with white women. There were riots um, against Filipinos for dancing, for dancing with these white women. So there's a way that, that, that music figures really deeply in, in, mm. in Filipino and Filipino American history. There's all kinds of things that, that we could talk about throughout sort of Filipino, Filipino history as well. But just thinking about thinking about music, music comes from the land. You know, you listen to uh, I was down in the Caribbean once sort of listening to listening to the birds and the lizards and how, and and the kinds of polyrhythms that they were that they were making and how similar they were to sort of to to Afro-Cuban um rumba um patterns. We were just out in in nature. I said of course, like the the music that we make is actually connected to the land itself, to the water, to 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 the to the wildlife, to the weather, to the to the to the storms. Mm. Um our our earliest art has always been has always been connected to the land and, and certainly that's true of sound and the other thing that i'll say too is that you know there there are some um um uh anthropologists i suppose um who suggest that um we in in percussion we when you're when you're playing the drums one of the things that you're you're thinking about is like you're talking in in spanish you estoy hablando I mean, I'm, I'm speaking with the drum, you know? Mm. And so the idea is that you're making the drum speak. In fact, in Africa, they also have, they have a, they have a talking drum, which sounds a little bit like a voice. But there are some um, anthropologists who believe that actually early human beings used to communicate with one another by hitting things first, before we even developed the facility Word. of language. Mm. Exactly. And so that language actually was initially an imitation of the drum not the other way around right and so there's this there's this um intertwining of of sound and language and um i i believe that they happen that they happen simultaneously and and when when we connect that to the fact that this is connected to the land there's this there's this convergence of language communication and our very ecology our local ecology mm -hmm. certainly the sounds that i hear in in rawway new jersey are different from the sounds that i hear from new york city which is just, just a half hour away and certainly different from from uh being in old san juan in in, in puerto rico or in 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 Loag, ilocos norte right that that the sounds of a place it itself begin to begin to enter us mm. and that's the last thing that i'll say about i know this is sort of a lot but the last thing that i'll say no about... it's it's a nice a lot <laughs> go and say more music the sound exist first as a sense of community when all these old and i think we still do that now i mean there's a lot of overseas filipino workers who gather and still have parties together <laughs> sing together that's to create right. a sense of community but if you think about it, music itself is the community. It's an ecosystem. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 That, that, you know, that an ecosystem is also made of vibrations. It's mm. made of, it's made of sound. We don't, we think of ecology as strictly, um, as strictly biological, but it's also energetic. Right. Mm. Um, the va various ecologies have have all these different sort of sort of energies and different different plants and animals attend to those vibrations. And in fact, there are mushrooms that need to be that need vibrations in order to, in order to grow. Right. So there are, there, really? there are all these really close um, sort of affiliations between sound and the environment. Interesting. And it really makes you wonder about the magic of words, the actual sound, the actual vibration that comes through and how do yeah. we how do we create it in our poetry as well? Um, it reminds me of one of those research by a Japanese person, not sure if he's a scientist, but um, I'm not sure if you've heard of it. There were things in a jar, I think they were like rice, oh, yeah. and he say words to those rice in a jar he'll right. say bad words to one jar and good and sweet words to another right. and the other one would turn moldy and the other one would persevere 
And it just reminds me of the magic of words, the magic that leaves mm -hmm. the words and the magic that leaves in sounds. The, the, the idea of a magic spell, right? Like that you're actually spelling, that to spell something is to conjure, is to conjure something through sound, right? Yeah. That's like we can actually invoke something through, through sound. Yes, all the chanting. And again, it it all goes back to that sense of community and you in that community. You also mentioned something really interesting, which is paying attention to the world. And as a nurse, I was trained to pay attention to the world. And obviously, you speak so passionately about paying attention as well. I hear things from my po poet friends. Um, they would say that, sometimes they would get mental block. I believe in mental block personally because I, I feel like there's just so much in the world that we could write about. If you were to spend a day with someone who is struggling to create a poem, someone who, who says that they're having mental block and you were to help them create something through paying attention, what would your day be like? Wow. If I was, if I was going to spend a day with that person? Yes. Uh, Let's say it's uh, me, actually, but Patrick, you know what? Okay. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> one month now, I haven't written anything, Patrick. I feel like I'm uh, having mental block. How would a Patrick Rosal advise me or and spend a day with me? We can go anywhere. Distance is not a problem. How would the day look like? I don't think that you have to travel far. I think that you could probably step right outside your front door or sit at the closest window and even as familiar as those sites are i bet you if you sit there long enough and pay attention long enough and and try to articulate the things that you're seeing that the poems are going to come I, you know there's just there's there's something about the 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 sort of the the practice of being even in the same place and just imagine you know you know Imagine in sort of like pre-literal times, you know, like, um, you know, our ancestors, you know, simply looking at the sky and watching how the moon travels or changes over the sky, that kind of, that kind of attention. And so um, I, I, the first thing I would say is like, let's go, let's go to a place that you already know very well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and let's just start, let's just start to name everything that we see. And then, um, mm -hmm. and to, and, and to, and is is it possible to look more closely at these very familiar things? What what's a way that you have not looked at these things um, before? Um, and then there's just so many so many different ways that you could do it. Like, what if what if you what if you became a different person and started looking at those things? What if you what if you became Jose Rizal? What if you became um, you know George Washington? What if you became um, you you, you 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 be, you just assumed a different persona, and then you started to to describe things. And there's all these games that you can play with, um, in order to look at the very familiar, um, in order to start to produce writing. I mean, I don't think that persona is the only way, but certainly it's the the at the heart of it really is it's description. It's just looking at something that you think has no poetry in it, and looking at it long enough to notice, like, oh my god that thing has this quality that I had I had never noticed before, or that thing reminds me of something else from before. And that sort of leap in time can also be, um, you know, a way into a way into writing. Sometimes it's just right in front of you, because I think that's also the problem that we, we became we become too familiar with things. And it's so hard mm. to unsee them when you kind of see them from a certain perspective that has always been there. I don't see anything special with it. But then you're saying to actually sit there and look deeper. So to meditate on those images or on what you're seeing. And describe. Yeah. Describe yeah. it. Yeah. How does a Patrick yeah. Rousseau, um <laughs> traverse from description to something more powerful i guess this first poem mm. started from you know the mere description of things and then it expands to so many yeah. angles so many areas until it also it, again it it kind of like focus on that goat is it a goat the, the last image that's about to be yeah killed. that's right yeah it's very powerful right. so how did you travel through that 
Um, so I guess now I'm going to contradict myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I think it's poets always a... contradict themselves in one way or another. <laughs> but we actually want to hear your processes. I'd love to hear what is the contradiction. Well, I mean, your first, your earlier question is about attention. And I think that this is, it's, I mean, the, the, the twin to attention is distraction. And so I think, um, you know, that, that as a poet, you attend towards something, but as your mind moves, um, and, and is to distract in Latin means to be, to be pulled away, um, from something. And if you're being pulled away by memory or by imagination or by association, that, that sometimes following that impulse to that memory or that other place, there's a, there's a psychic sort of subconscious reason why the thing that you're looking at is connected to this thing that belongs in a different time or in a different place or in a different universe and simply follow it and and don't try to don't try to think about like why did i think about an eggplant when i was looking at this church like what this church and an eggplant just allow the church and the eggplant to be in the poem <laughs> yeah and, and 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 figure and let the poem actually show you and i think that I, so when I think the other thing too, maybe to expand on the, the previous question that you had asked is like one of the things that we're paying attention to is attention itself, is how our attention changes and shifts and just to be, be able to allow it to move, but also be, to be aware of watching how our attention moves from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. Those leaps to me, as much as sort of like an intensive description, are those things are really beautiful to me. I love I love like extended descriptions, but I also love these the 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 sudden leaps mm -hmm. that those descriptions can sort of um, initiate for us. Mm -hmm. So it's as if allowing your intuition to get on work and just follow where it would take you. Just go with the flow. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a little I bit was, like jazz too, you know. It's like I was music. gonna I was gonna ask the same question. <laughs> do you think that this is very similar to music? Or do you think that music music or sound when you use it in your poetry do you think that it helps you kind of um guide you to whatever path you're meant you're meant to go to and i ask this because i was talking to an artist um just the other day and he said that sometimes with regards to singing you think of singers think of the pitch first even before the words come out even before mm. they sing so that that, mm. that that pitch that they have to to hit even before mm -hmm. language is mm -hmm. created, which is very synonymous to mm -hmm. what you were saying a while ago. So, do you think that your music, or how, how do you how do you do that in your poetry? How do you use music and expansion of your theme in your work? There's a there's a sort of widely known anecdote about the great um, jazz saxophonist Charlie Parker that. You know, he could be he could be playing at a club um, and in the middle of a solo, you know, somebody would scream something or some, you know, some interruption would come. Right. Like this doesn't happen in classical music, but at a jazz club, you know, anything can happen. Like people are making noise at the bar. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the things that Charlie Parker could do was be able to integrate the sounds that arrived in the room into his solo. And so there's this. There's this kind of flexibility and openness of like jazz players that, you know, sort of philosophically, I think is part of my own composition pro process too, as a writer, is that let things in, like don't work too hard to keep everything out. And that the interruptions themselves are like, they're, they're teaching you something. They're showing you a possibility of, of, of your writing that, um, that you might not arrive without them, you know, and they're, they're gifts, you know? Yes, to let things in, don't barricade things out. That really resonated with me because sometimes you would work on something and then something would come up and, and you feel like, huh, what's happening with this? I just want to focus on something. And I guess it right. ties back to what you're saying. It's not about thinking. It's about intuition and letting your feelings flow through. And surrender too, right? Surrender. Like, like I think, I, I feel like, sometimes as writers we can we can want we can be too willful with the page and 
and one of the beautiful things about about writing is that it, the language doesn't allow us to impose our will. If it, if we impose our will, then the poem usually fails. Mm -hmm. But if we bring our will and our desire to the page and we listen to the page back, the page transforms what we want. We bring our desire to the page and looking at what we put down on the page shows us something that we didn't know and, and even can change or make clearer or or surprise us with something that we didn't know that we wanted. And so an, a kind of surrender to what is being revealed to us on the page, I feel like is an important part of um, the practice of writing. Mm, so you are communicating with your work. Absolutely, all the time. Are you, don't you? I do. <laughs> Sometimes I communicate with my work like this. Please tell me what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sometimes you beg. It's hard. Sometimes it's just that allowing your poem to to sit there if it needs to be Absolutely. and not pull too much, um, yeah. not demand too much from yourself as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's been really nice chatting with you. I'm it's really great. I'm wondering if you could uh, treat us to another poem, perhaps from... Oh. from your new book from the new and selected sure poem. inspected poems has an actual title the last thing yes or it's called thing. the last thing in fact maybe i'll maybe i'll read the i haven't really had a chance of, of all the readings i've done since the book came out i haven't read the title poem um so i'll i'll read that one um yes, it's called the last thing or song for when they take it all away so i'll tell let me just tell a quick story is that I was I was on a Fulbright fellowship to the Philippines um, back in 2009, actually when Typhoon Ondoy hit. Oh. And um, while I was out there, you know, I was I was much poorer than I than I am now and uh, back then. And um, I had most of my belongings in a storage space, and I could not afford to pay the monthly uh, fee. And um, they sold all my stuff. You know, I lost every, almost everything that I owned while I was in the Philippines. So when I came mm -hmm. back, there was, I had, I, you know, there was, there was a lot of stuff that I lost. So this poem is sort of occasioned by, by that memory. The last thing or song for when they take it all away. They take the books, the crates of 80s 12 inch singles, a few dozen letters from Manila, LA, Seville. They take my stinky trash can and cracked plastic chair, the rickety plywood shelves, 11 photos of my mother leaving me with one. They take the dim shots of my brother's young faces beside mine. They take away the clean sheets folded among the soiled ones, the hand towels stained with fevers and shit and official notices of all my debt stuffed in a box with three dead flies. Oh, and the tangled brush of a woman whom I loved for one whole week, which remembering her makes me lift my hand as if to propose half a prayer or to illustrate the best way to answer a deaf king is to drop a fist on a heavy table in place of blasphemy's last syllable. They take it all from a cold rented five foot space. And when I can't pay, they cross out my name, double shackle the gate, fill every proper form and price the pitiful lot for the block. They call me to cough up over and over, say, explain yourself. Shame is like your maid of 10,000 beautiful doors and every day you try to keep them all from flying open at once they reach inside and take the boxes of shoes and old shirts the third hand scratched up oak desk i heaved up 20 steps overlooking west grand ave with their battalions of metallic hands they'll take away silence they'll take away touch they'll take music too which is when i'll stand up alone and walk toward you and offer a few fingers for you to 
lead me to an empty floor and sway. They'll take the light, they'll confiscate my teeth and leave the knives with no handles. They take it all away. They take away weeping and take away laughter, not last to go are the goats, as if I could forget the curses and ha ha, they'll take my eyes and they won't even eat them. They have taken so much. I am standing now somewhere at the end of a road which leads to a beach beside a sea that a million ghosts keep crossing, leaving everything I once had, everything I've become, everything electric and a muscle to make one minuscule move again toward the beautiful in that wacky wandering, in that bloody path, in that smoky inventory of a quarter century, in that ambling, in that sprint toward every gorgeous living thing, no matter how tortured or peaceful I am going. I am almost completely gone. I'm stepping away. Watch me as I leave the forks. I leave the hammers. I leave the bones. I am left with love. I leave the boiled coins, the thin shells of swans. I am left with love. I leave the latches and bolts open. I am left again and again with love. I leave and I leave and I am left again and again and I can't seem to shake it. The rage leaves me and leaves me again and again and love is left. It is all that is ever left and today I am blessed. I am the last thing burning. Beautiful. They took everything away. Oh, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Roma. You have um, a prompt for our audience, for our viewers. Um, so this is a somewhat complicated one, but hopefully people will be up to the challenge, yeah? Um, so um, try to write um, nine short questions that a ghost asks you. Listen and listen to the nine questions that a ghost will answer you, uh, will will ask you. And your job is to answer every single one of those questions with a single image. Thank you so much, Pat. I would do You're that welcome. as well. <laughs> Thank oh, let you. me know how it goes. <laughs> I will. It's been so nice talking to you. I hope we could meet each other in person. Me too. Me too. Let me know when you're over on this side and I'll let you know when I've crossed the pond too. Yes, please. Yes, please.